Okay. Okay, I think we should start up so. So, hi folks, uh, my name is Kevin O'Brien, I'm in the west of Ireland, and welcome to the last YR seminar of our, their season. What we're going to do is we're going to take a break for a while while use R is on. So we'll probably come back in late July or early August. And so tonight we have our last uh, speaker is of the year is J.D. Long. And J.D. Long is joining us from Richmond, Virginia. And he is an enterprise uh, risk manager with Renaissance Re. And he is also the author of the R cookbook, the co-author. And also he's very well known in the R community. He's involved in the Chicago R user group. He's been along to a lot of Saturdays. You've probably seen him also at R Studio Conf. That he's very well known on in the in the R community. And we're glad to have him to be the last speaker of the season. So JD is going to introduce a, a talk. He's going to give us a talk called uh, helping drive data science adoption in organizations, taking, uh, sorry, I forgot the first name of it, but JD will sort of re reintroduce it there. So I'll let JD take it away there. Thanks, JD. I'll let you hand over there. I'll sign off and let you get cracking. Hey, thanks, Kevin. Appreciate it so much. Thank you for inviting me to be here. I, um, <clears throat> I hope that I am not too untechnical for, uh, for this audience. If you guys came here for uh, fantastic uh, code dumps, uh, this is not going to be it because I'm going to talk a little bit about culture and how the, we can enable uh, people to get excited about tools um, and how we can help them uh, adopt tools. And now my experience is not the right experience. I'm going to share with you all my experience from inside of a situation in corporate America. I have no idea how this transfers to, uh, to folks in other uh, life experiences or, or in other settings. Uh, I think some of it's transferable, but I, I don't uh, hesitate to claim that it is. Um, <clears throat> so largely we're gonna talk about taking the friction out of, out of R, but really this applies to other tools. There's a very little in here that's gonna be R specific. Um, R, the shop I work at is, is multilingual. Um, multilingual, um, means that we, you know, we, we switch between Python and R. We've actually got a smaller R community uh, than we have Python community, uh, but we try to enable the same friction reducing tools uh, in both. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about, about, about some of that. Now, um, get my slides working here, sorry. Uh, I, since I was introduced to working at Renaissance Re and the stock at Renaissance, Sensory trades down every time my name is mentioned in close proximity to the company name. I do have to say this is my personal review uh, views. Nothing here is from Renaissance Re. Uh, it's thought provoking only. This isn't consulting, and I'm not giving financial advice. Um, now, with that said, what have I observed in my life experience drives adoption? And here I'm specifically talking about adoptions of, of tech tools, right? So, what drives adoption? It's really usefulness. If people find tools useful, if they help, if these tools help them solve problems that are annoying or painful to them, they will adopt the tools. Uh, it's really simple as that. Now, it's not so simple because there's a headwind. Well, what's the headwind? What, what prevents adoption? The single biggest prevention of adoption is cost. Now, I realize this is, this is an R meetup. We're open source people. So what the heck, everything's free. How, how can I talk about cost? Well, I'm, I'm an economist by training. And so cost isn't just financial cost. It's like the full economic cost. And part of that equal economic cost is time. Time is not free. If everything's free in your software, software the time, and it's almost always the time it takes to learn and get proficient with the tool, or at least learn enough to get good outcomes. That's not free. Time is the largest cost of any tool. Even the paid tools that we pay for, a big chunk of our cost is not the check we write the software company, but it's the amount of time our employees spend getting useful uh, with those tools. So time is our big headwind as we think about adoption. Well, 
I've been given a little introduction, but now that you guys know where we're going and what I'm gonna yammer on about, and I presume all the people who aren't interested have already left the call right now. Let me tell you a little bit about me. I'll keep this short, but just to let you know where I'm coming from. Uh, I'm the author of the, uh, of the R Cookbook, um, now available in Chinese, at a bookseller near you. Um, it's free online, rc2e.com. Uh, as you Google things, you may have come across a site called Cookbook for R. That's not me. Uh, great site though, wonderful content. And uh, I, I benefit every time somebody confuses uh, their website with my website. Uh, so our cookbook, second edition is written by myself and Paul Teeter. Paul wrote the first edition. Uh, I updated it in second edition. Um, and then we maintain it together. Paul's a friend of mine. I've known him since I uh, started the Chicago R user group some years ago when I, when I lived in Chicago and I helped uh, found the user group there. Uh, now, some of you may know me from Twitter. I run my mouth regularly. I now live in Richmond, Virginia. I used to work part-time in Raleigh, North Carolina. I'm all the time out of my house here in Richmond, Virginia, my fortress of solitude, if you will. And uh, so you may know me from there. Uh, you may also know me uh, from presentations at our studio available online and for ridiculous t-shirts that say things like spreadsheets and bullshit because you just can't explain to your child that you do agricultural economics for a living. So I have simplified it down. This is what lots of us do. Although we talk about data science and we talk about big distributed networks and these uh, you know, rolling things out on AWS. If we are in industry, lots of us are really fighting the spreadsheet monster, if you will. And when we talk about driving adoption, one of the things we're talking about is moving monstrosities out of Excel or other spreadsheeting tools and moving them into managed code repositories that are transparent, documented, uh, managed and understood and able to be deployed uh, differently than you might deploy uh, an Excel spreadsheet. So I like a little nod to spreadsheets. There are many of us, they're our first introduction to programming. So they're actually super good learning tools as long as we understand the edge of their usefulness. Now I work now at Renaissance Re. Uh, we're a Bermuda-based reinsurance company, the way I do describe it to my daughter when she isn't happy with spreadsheets and bullshit as what daddy does for a living. I explain that we insure insurance companies. So what's the typical learning pattern? Well, as we think about inside our organizations, driving the adoption of something like R, <clears throat> a new analytical tool, we think about the classroom model because all of us came almost certainly most everyone on this call, not everyone, most everyone came through a traditional classroom model. Maybe there's a lecture, maybe there were some exercises, uh, but we moved uh, from building a base through some level of, of mastery uh, of a tool or a set of concepts. So we start with foundations. So if we were gonna take a you know, introduction computer science class at your local university, there'll be some discussion of data types. What's an integer? What's a string? What's floating point mean? We start with these foundation concepts because everything after this sort of builds on that. So we build up from the foundation and then maybe ultimately we get into doing some mathematics. And then in the second semester course, we discuss really abstract things like uh, data frames that are, are collections of bunch of stuff. Well, that kind of looks like this, right? Foundational concepts, intermediate concepts, complex abstractions, do things with those, maybe build and write algorithms later. And we'll de devote full semester classes to thinking about algorithm writing. Well, think about everything that you have learned on your own. So many of us have maybe self-taught an instrument. We've learned a hobby. Uh, we've tried to get better at a, at a sport. Maybe we joined a CrossFit gym and needed to learn how to do uh, the lifts associated with CrossFit to do them in a safe way. How did we learn those things? Most of us, when we think about how we learned it, 
we learn the pieces needed to accomplish a specific end. So many of us, if we're learning a guitar, learning a, a musical instrument, learning guitar, what we often start with is I would like to play the rhythm guitar section in some song. And so what we learn is enough to get us to that specific end. And then after that, we maybe learn something else. And often we only drop back and learn theory uh, after we've learned a number of specifics. So it looks a little more like this cycle where we figure out some step, we hit a roadblock, we learn a specific thing to get past that roadblock, and then we blow through that roadblock, and then we ultimately need to figure something out. I postulate here that this is the way most of us learn uh, computing concepts and technical topics uh, once we're outside of academia. We're really just trying to get something specific done and we iterate this over and over and over. Um, but yet when we try to teach internal classes, we tend to think, oh wait, this is a class. I know how classes work. We start with the foundation. I would like to challenge that you may not need to teach foundations. If we teach people to be useful, to solve a specific class of problems and give them enough tools to do it. Will they understand all the data types? Nah, they won't, nobody cares. Nobody wants to know the data types. They want to get something done. Now, many of them that stick with it and need to get hung up later uh, with trying to do some calculation and something can't coerce into an integer, uh, they discover then that they care about data types and they're willing to learn, but they don't necessarily need to learn that to get useful uh, right out of the gate. So what I'm presenting here is one of the barriers to adoption of technical tools is how we teach them. That we don't teach them as, here's how to get useful rapidly. We teach them as, here's a body of knowledge that you should master. And people respond very well in my life experience with the iterative process of getting a useful result and then learning something else, trying to solve a harder problem, get that solved, get a useful re result, and then just keep iterating. So uh, iterating through this cycle, I, I think above and beyond just a good idea for industry, I think this is the single most important technical skill a knowledge worker can have today. Um, my sister homeschools a number of kids and uh, she only half jokingly will say, um, you know, I only teach the kids one thing. Oh, it's only one thing. Oh, like, okay, I'll bite what's the one thing you teach the kids? And she'll say, I teach them how to learn something they don't already know. That is kind of the meta skill. And she's like, oh, I do that iteration in math. I do that in science. I do that in English. I do that in history. And often I tie together the literature and the history together. So they're doing both at the same time. They don't know that. But I have them figure out something they don't know. And she said, that's especially good with math and science because each step is something they don't know. And I basically define them a small enough sliver that they have to go figure it out and come back and present it to me. And I'm like, crap, she's kind of onto something. Um, you know, the best beginner train training focuses on getting a task done. Now, when my sister's doing that with her kids, she defines the task. When we're in a work environment or uh, in academia, often that next task we need done is is self-defined. We know the thing we're trying to accomplish, what the, what the next step is. And so it's just making sure we have somebody to help us get the answer or figure out how to figure out what the answer is. So this is, a, uh, this is an R generated graph that I generated. And it's, um, it's based on work by Kathy Sierra who taught uh, Java years ago. She's a wonderful educator and thought incredibly clearly about this topic. And she referred to, uh, to this graph, I believe, as the kick-ass curve. The idea being there's some threshold of skill, low skill, that she called the suck threshold. And if you are operating below that level of skill, every single thing that the, that the practitioner is trying to do is painful. Everything sucks. It's hard, you can't ever make the software do what you want it to do. Everything's painful and you hate it. And then there's an area above the suck threshold where you get things done, it doesn't suck, 
but it may be a lot of work, maybe a little bit of difficulty. You stop and you have to do yak shaving to learn something new or figure something new out. And then there's the kick-ass threshold. When one skill is above the kick-ass threshold, things just happen. It's almost like you're thinking in code. You're putting that, well, in the R example, right? Or in a coding example. Um, um, you're not thinking about the tool. You're not thinking about uh, how to, what the syntax is. You're just expressing your ideas on uh, the screen and you're getting work done. That's an amazing place to be. And if people struggle long, we may say, oh, well, it gets the same asymptote, right? We're all giddy heading towards some high level of skill. It's just some folks get there fast and others don't. This graph is misleading because the reality is if someone is on the slow uh, path, they often just abandon the tool, often right in here, somewhere down in the level of suck where it's just this, I can't get anything done. And I can't figure out what the words are to Google how to get something done. What we want to do as we think about adoption is help people get off of this uh, green path and onto a red path and help them not feel like they have to abandon the tool in order to get something done. So this image uh, sticks in my head as I try to help people with, with tool adoption because we don't want abandonment of the tool to be the path of least resistance. We want people to be successful and have wins. Well, how can workplaces, which is my background, help with this process? Well, it's all about the off-ramps or, or the on-ramp, depending on which way you're looking at it from. The off-ramp from your existing tooling and the on-ramp onto some new set of toolings. So we wanna go from the tools we know over into new tools. You'll find certain personality types are always drawn to new tools. That's fine, certain personality types, just once they got something that works, they just don't ever wanna leave it. And if we make the off-ramp from the old tools and the on-ramp to the new tools easier, we take friction out of that process, we'll find people if they can dip into the new tool, but maybe not have to completely abandon their security blanket of the old tools, maybe even make them work well together, uh, we can drive adoption incrementally. Uh, if the goal should be solving their pain, not make them use a new tool. So what are big obstacles? Um, I struggled here because there's lots of obstacles and I'm not sure which ones are the biggest and what priority. But some that I have observed is, is the computing environment. Um, I come from corporate America where there's often you know, rules and restrictions around what can be installed. So just getting R, an IDE, maybe that's uh, Jupyter, notebooks, R Studio, whatever tooling you're writing in, maybe you're writing a different IDE, and then access to the needed libraries is often a non-trivial exercise. And what we need to think about doing is in our data science shops, in our analytical shops and organizations, is how do we take the friction out of this? Now, that may mean, if we're gonna be running desktop environments, it may mean we gotta work with our IT departments to make this easy. We gotta make sure anyone that comes on our team gets a default setup, but then has the ability to customize it. There's not one size fits all of how to take the friction out of this, but thinking about environment is a huge part because in my world, a lot of folks are just real comfortable with Excel. They come into the organization with Excel and then they run into something like, huh, I've got this linear regression and I'd really like to run that every day. And I'm getting tired of refreshing this in Excel. Huh, have I got an answer for you? And if it takes them three days to get R installed on their desktop, or it takes them a week, or it's gotta have four different approvals in order to get done, they're gonna go, nah, I'll just open it every morning and, and refresh the Excel spreadsheet, it's fine, that that's good enough. And they'll never move into a new tool that would power them for solving way more complicated processes, way harder problems. Uh, because of the friction caused by not being able to get an environment set up. So environments are a real uh, impediment and an introduction of friction. The next I see, and, and academics, in my experience, have less of this. 
and, and practitioners in industry have more of this. And that's database issues. So in my world, everything is stored in, in a couple of different databases. One of them is a Redshift on Amazon and that uses Postgres drivers. And then the other is a series of, of SQL Server databases. And just getting the database connections set up the first time is a royal, royal pain. And it's different on Mac and it's different on Windows and it's different on, on Unix or Linux. And getting those right, um, the answer to what is right is different depending on which platform you're on. So those are incredibly painful. So you know, I have tried to set up ways to make all of these work in all those different platforms and make sure the users have quick access to that uh, so that they don't get caught in um, not understanding how to get access to the data they need in order to actually begin to do something with the tool that they're trying to learn. So once again, the goal, getting useful fast and not spending a lot of time struggling with configurations. Another one I see, and once again, this is fairly industry heavy, um, is specialized templates for input and output. Um, I work with, a, with an insurance company who was trying to get their analyst to uh, use a little more R. And one of the biggest issues they had is they had a very specific output format that they had to use to submit uh, data to a government agency. And they want to do two things. They want to read that format in. So they currently have tools that generate this. They wanted to read that data in from those formats and do some analysis. Then they also wanted to be able to write to that format so they could do customized things you know, in R and then report that data to the government. And it was just enough different from the standard uh, delimited options that it was kind of hard. So, you know, they, I work with them in, in, uh, in the industry and they were just brainstorming with me about, hey, how do you guys make it easier? And, you know, I said, one of the things you might do is consider making a little library for R that has an export to this format uh, as one of the functions. And they were like, wow, we never thought about that. We didn't even think about like having our own internal library to make the stuff we do faster and easier. And you can imagine also having this for templates for reporting. Uh, so if you do a lot of R markdown, you could have your reports just load your template uh, for your company or your organization and generate output with the color schemes and the formatting, the way you're used to looking at it and seeing it can take a lot of friction out. And just not having to futz around with the, the template in PowerPoint or Word template analysts can immediately see when, if they're seeing that they can generate output that already matches their corporate branding or the organizational branding without with having to do actually less work than the tools that they're used to. So that can be a big win for adoption. Now, hosted solutions are a solution, kind of redundant, but they really solve a bunch of these. So, you know, we have a uh, Jupyter Lab environment internally um, also work some with RStudio. And the neat thing about that is we can pre-configure database connections and pre-configure libraries to be available so that the analyst, all they have to do is log into a website and they immediately have a working environment. That's a tremendously big win for taking friction out of configuration and the hosted tools are so good. RStudio hosted is fantastic, full-fledged IDE. Um, I'm beginning to look at adding uh, the underlying text editor for VS Code and quite possibly soon VS Code as a hosted solution uh, where all of that is running on, on our remote hardware with big RAM, big CPU, and analysts can just work on it like it's their desktop. Now it does, for some of us, it feels like we're going back to the future uh, of mainframe where we're remoting in, but we're in a rich text environment. It feels like a desktop app, but we're interacting with big hardware that's running somewhere else and having a first class experience. And we didn't have to configure an environment. Huge win, right? Huge win for adoption. It just makes the learning curve so much shorter because we don't have to do all this environments, database driver, where are the templates, load the things. It's just there. And 
I think that's a tremendous solution. So having is not equal to using though. So everything I talked about in the last slide is about having the environment, having the database connections, having the templating. Once that's in place, that's not enough because that's necessary, but it's not sufficient. So it helps individuals if they have examples of how to use code. Now, often the lowest, um, lowest common denominator is to point people to existing projects. Maybe you've got a GitHub and you can point new users to existing code. And so the examples become the things we've done for other projects. That's helpful. It's not nothing, it's meaningful. And the best thing about it is it's code that actually runs. Now, the problem with that is because it's code that's actually runs and is being used for something, it often does a lot of things. It's not just a very crisp example of how to solve one problem, it's solving a whole workflow of problems. That can be challenging for learners because they can't pull apart what's the one thing I need. The other challenge with it is it makes it feel like there's infinite things to learn because they look at it and all they see is all the things they don't know. So I have found it helpful to pull specific, small defined examples of common business problems and have examples. Now, we have some example queries of how to use our databases. Those you know, maybe live on a wiki. Um, code examples are great, how to solve a specific problem. If you're a multilingual shop, maybe you have a document with here's how we solve this problem or this specific um, formatting issue in R, here's how we solve it in Python. You, know, you might show them right next to each other and that's super useful. Then your um, examples end up being kind of a Rosetta Stone for people learning new tools that come from one environment or one language and they're wanting to learn the other. Well, learn with something they care about. Uh, so that's the code snippets. Um, sometimes it's helpful to have just copy this and paste it and get some result. That's a good way to learn. And, you know, I have been in, in the data science world. Um, I think a lot about how do we take the 20% of professional development tools that give us 80% of the benefit, sort of the Pareto trade-off. And one of the things my professional developer friends are hesitant about is um, magic incantations. Oh, you, they don't really understand it. They're just using a magic incantation. They just copy and pasted that from the wiki or from other code. Um, that's true. If you're a professional developer, you probably shouldn't be using any code that's pure magic incantation. We regularly in data science, in configuration, have bits of code in our workflow that just gets the environment where we need it. And we carry that forward project by project. And then one day we decide we actually need to change it. And so we learn it. And so I think starting with magic incantations as part of the learning process is okay. Of course, we don't want people to go forever not knowing what the magic incantations do or not understanding the defaults of the methods and just carrying that forward. You get some ridiculously dumb stuff. So I'm never defending that as the end scenario. I will defend it as lubricating the on-ramp to learning, right? To, oh, if I can actually get something that produces an output I'm interested in as a learner, that's exciting. Even if I don't 100% understand all the steps, that's the next iteration, is to then understand more of what goes on there. So don't rule out magic incantations. So in addition, we could do some written guides. We could do white paper-ish sort of things. We might do a uh, internal document that explains uh, how to solve a common problem we have, or how to build a certain type of model. If we're heavy on um, you know, nearest neighbor analysis, hey, why not code up an example and have it documented in a book that's, that shows a functional way of doing a certain type of analysis? Book down uh, makes this incredibly easier than it used to be. Uh, now, when we did, when, when Paul and I did, did our cookbook, um, one of the things we did is we did the whole thing in our markdown using the book down package. 
So if you go to the, the website, there's a link to our GitHub repository. You can see the source code on GitHub for all of the R cookbook second edition. Um, having examples written in code that then renders documentation is super useful, uh, especially when you're trying to teach technical tools because you, there's code examples and we know the code examples run because they run every time we build the book. And it also makes it easy if you like us, a lot of what you're wanting to show is time-based. And some of our existing examples that aren't, weren't built with something like Bookbound, the examples are from 2007. And folks look at it, and it's kind of like that all looks sort of out of date. And even if the concepts are right, one of the things I like about having Bookbound based written guides is I can change like a date setting in the beginning of the document, rebuild it, and all of my examples in my documentation rebuild using data from our database from a more current, current time period. All of a sudden I have made refreshing my documentation to keep it current, to keep it fresh, a lot easier. Now that doesn't solve the problem of if your database changes or your business process changes, that's not gonna fix that. You still gotta maintain documentation, but you can keep the examples current uh, if all it needs is more recent data from the database, and you can make that almost painless. As I mentioned earlier, another tool that takes a bunch of friction out is internal packages. Uh, internal packages to, to make repetitive steps that everyone's doing, make those where you share a common code base. There's a huge benefit to that. It prevents error, it ensures everyone's using the same methodology, and it takes just pain and friction out, especially around things like uh, connecting to a database. Internal docs with Bookdown, which I alluded to, I've been working on, a, on an internal guide to our uh, computing system for RIS, uh, the RIS team. I'm on the RIS management team. You know, so these are just the bits that I have stubbed out, not fully fleshed out. I was working on the section about using GitHub and how do we get analysts using that. Um, huge beneficial resource and I have I've already like I don't have this thing done it's very much in a uh, hung in the middle because I haven't had time to throw at it I've had two analysts already go through it and be like oh wow you saved me so much time it's not even done I just shoved it over on github and put an entry in our wiki that said I'm working on this and folks are already using it it helps me know there's appetite in my organization for better documentation and and step by step because otherwise, for a new hire to learn each one of these things and get them done right, an existing employee has to sit down and mentor them for every step. And it takes a lot of time. If we can short circuit that by having an employee only have to do Q&A after they work through these examples, answer questions, maybe clarify things, we've shortened the amount of time that an existing employee has to spend sort of onboarding a, a new employee. And because I'm me, I also wrote this stuff in kind of interesting language. Um, and I find that helps too, rather than incredibly dry technical language. I write it like I speak. And I have found that's tremendously beneficial. Somebody told me it's like reading a blog post um, about how to do this stuff. And that's exactly the spirit I try to capture in my documentation. I don't want to read like I'm the Microsoft manual of stuff. That's exactly the opposite. Their language tends to be much more formal. Mine's very informal. Mine says things like, I've always found this step painful. Here's my workaround. And it's like, oh, you're being candid with me, the reader, about what's hard. I like that. So write documentation that's written, that's written for humans and has a human tone. All right, so let's think a little bit about internal packages. Let me give you just a contrived example of how internal packages can uh, reduce friction. So you know, you could make our custom lib as a library and then have a function connect to our DB. And if, if, if your databases, you have five SQL Server databases, each one has a name right here, right? There's something you call it, make it the human name, they call it. Um, and then pass it the username and the password and have it return the connection. Um, this function, if you have it in a library, could also do really interesting stuff like, figure out which operating system a user is on and use different database drivers depending on which one they're on. Think about how much pain uh, every new project, how much pain this would save on every new project 
to just be able to connect to the database without having to go muck through uh, wiki pages to remember which driver we use for which one. And if this is smart enough, uh, it could run on a Linux environment, connect to your database, and also run on your Mac environment or your Windows environment, connect to databases and not break. That's huge. Like I have done this exact uh, design pattern for the databases and the systems I connect to. And even if no one else uses it, this is such a time saver for me uh, that it was worth my time to put it together. Um, now, I've done something here I want to point out. I want to point out these last two lines. Um, notice where it says like sys get in env. Uh, I'm pulling an environment variable named uid, the, the user id, and then I'm pulling an environment named pwd, the password. This is the sort of thing, but you could do this with other ways. This is the way I do it for making sure we don't accidentally end up with user credentials in our GitHub repository or stored in files where we don't want. As a practice, uh, I'm setting my UID and my password as environment variables uh, on whatever machine I'm running. And then it's picking them up, sliding them in here. So my code never has um, my, my credential stored in it. I don't have these accidental blow ups where I check in to GitHub uh, my credentials on accident and have to deal with all the friction and pain. Because why? Because if a new user has that, and then they got to figure out how do you back that junk out, maybe get IT involved, then they got to change their credentials. What they learn is this tool sucks and is painful. And that's not what we want them to learn. We want them to learn some good best practices right out of the gate so they don't blow their toes off accidentally. And this is a way we can help do it is a little bit of tooling to nudge them and make doing the right thing easy. Now, you may have credential management tools in your organization where you don't need this. You've got another method. If you, That's great. If you're only using Windows, um, you know, have it prompt the user. There's other ways to prompt for it. I don't want it prompt because I want my code to be able to run uh, unattended without prompting the user for input. So I store in environment variables. It isn't, I'm not saying this is the way to do it. I'm saying give people a way to do it. Give your learners a way to do it, a good practice to help them not make a mistake. The other thing you can do is use this style package. So use this is a, is a library uh, put together by the folks at our studio. And it's a neat concept. And I haven't seen a lot of these types of packages in other uh, systems outside of R. It's a very much a meta package. Your code that you write, uh, that you check into GitHub and run, will never have used this code. Use this code is like meta code that you run to change your project in that you're working on in some way. So here's an example. If you want to add a unit test to the project you're working on, you can load, use this, and then run the use test and give it a test name. It will add test that, which is the te a testing library, uh, in, into your, this assumes you're writing a package, into your, uh, into your project for your package. It'll create the directory trees that are needed. It'll create the testing files that are needed. It'll stub out uh, the functions that are needed. And then you got to go in and edit the test. And it just saved you a whole bunch of templating effectively by using this call and it adds all the junk you need, including the libraries. So it just, it adds like the boilerplate in by calling a command. I've seen this in a few other places. Python's got some similar examples. Use this is super neat. Well, you could do that with your internal packages as well. Why not an internal use this style package? Maybe use our Airflow and the name of an ETL function in the library you're working in. And maybe it adds uh, the, the script that controls Airflow. It adds a DAG to the project. And then it tells you to edit that DAG in order to set your runtime. This is hypothetical. I haven't actually built this. This is an example of something we could build. I'm sure your organization has repetitive things that people are doing all the time uh, that have a bunch of steps, but the steps are always exactly the same. And when those are in code, 
They tend to get used more and they tend to get used more correctly over and over. So why not let the tool write some code for you? It's a neat idea. I like it a lot. So the, let me give just, just kind of, I've, I've, I've mentioned a whole bunch of stuff, right? I've mentioned a whole bunch of ideas. Let's talk real quick about progression, how these tend to progress. I wouldn't want anybody listening to me say, think to get value, you've got to do all of these things right now. That's not typical and it's not effective. Usually uh, organizations start with something like wiki posts on how to do a given task. Then maybe they add informal buddy training. Now your buddy may be your boss if you're a small organization or it may be a peer, but basically there's gonna be some how to and your buddy's gonna sit there with you and make sure you get the right environment, tell you who to contact at IT if something doesn't work, help you interpret what you're seeing. Then the progression beyond that is later they begin to write, buddies get exhausted. And so we begin to write a user guide on how to do things. Uh, that maybe takes the burden off the buddy. So the buddy then becomes a, a, someone to ask questions to. Um, and then maybe we build then an informal code library of examples. These could be things on GitHub, they might be on your wiki. Uh, they'll be somewhere in your organization. And then Eventually, maybe we add formalized internal documentation. Um, that's actually a good progression, right? And what we're kind of doing in a bunch of these steps is we're doing something informally and then we're adding a formalized version, but not too much formalization. So we start with wiki posts and buddies. And then we kind of upgrade our, our, our wiki posts to an internal user guide. That's adding a little bit more uh, structure, a little bit more thought. And then our buddy becomes slightly less of a trainer and more of a Q&A person. And then we start adding code libraries and internal documentation, which is upping things more. And then what I, what I don't have here is then internal libraries. Well, that's your code examples, more formalized. And instead of, oh, here's how you do all the steps to do this piece of code, it's here's the function to call that will do these things. And here's what the inputs are. So the normal progression is to not jump straight to the end and try to implement an internal library. If your environment still takes three or four days to get enough internal permissions to get things working, you're not gonna see a huge benefit from all the time you're gonna throw at building an internal library. Go incrementally, get the environment first, and then start adding each of these pieces. Your documentation should be the thing that as a buddy you're doing with your new hire or your, or your new member of your team. That tells you what should be in the documentation, whatever it is you have to go over with them. And it'll vary in every organization. And so as we think about how do we get the on-ramp to work better, it's all about taking pain out, taking friction out, and helping the learner or the new adopter feel safe exploring the area and feel like, you know, they aren't gonna blow their toes off. That's my example about, you know, making sure we, we teach them how to handle credentials and we have a method for that. Uh, help them understand it's a safe place to learn and help them be useful quickly. And useful here is, is defined by them, not by me. If it's making their life better, they're gonna use the tool and they're probably gonna keep using it in new ways. But when they come to the tool, if it's nothing but pain day after day, they're gonna abandon the tool and stick with what they know. So that's effectively, oops, I forgot to mention formal internal classes. As I rolled my mouse up, I discovered there is the need for formal internal classes. This is my mention earlier though, of don't feel like you have to teach those like you're teaching a computer science course. We're uh, running a trade shop, most of us, not a theoretical shop. So help the learner learn the tools of the trade that are all focused around accomplishing some task. You may want to periodically run theory courses around some aspect of machine learning, some aspect of, uh, of data science, but a bunch of the training we've talked about here will be around th the coding tool. And the goal with the coding tool is be useful, be able to solve some set of problems. So teach that way, teach towards solving uh, specific problems. 
Okay, we're going to ask the uh, other the host to come back in at this point. I'll just remind you, I'm I'm JD Long. I go by JD. My first name is James. Uh, middle name is David. And here's my personal email as well as my Twitter account. Uh, if anybody wants to reach out to me and say hi, um, you're welcome to. All right, now I'm going to stop my share and turn back over to our host. Hi there, folks. So we got some great questions here on YouTube. So I'll just run through a few of them here, actually. I just got uh, uh, two from March, and I'll just do them in the order I have them. So Thanks, the uh, what is the critical point to divide an internal company R package into a set of smaller R packages? Like, oh, that's a, that's a great question. So I had this conversation actually recently with a friend. I wonder if this is the same friend because this is uh, if not, it's it's not surprising because it's an obvious question. Um, okay, I think of Donald Knuth's comment about uh, premature optimization being the the root of all sorts of problems in, in computing, right? And my observation has been um, separate libraries is an optimization. Uh, we're solving some problem by putting them in separate libraries. So I tend to solve this sort of problem empirically, and that is put them all in one library or one package until there starts to be an obvious pain with them all being there and then split them up. So that pain may be uh, different groups are using them and uh, that's causing some piece of pain and they, they need to only, they're, they're, I can imagine one example would be a bunch of data analysis functions and then a bunch of graphic uh, like ggplot templates and, and graphic uh, configuration things. Um, if we could imagine that maybe those have different uses by different teams and need to be maintained differently. If for some reason having them in the same project is causing a pain, break them up. My suspicion is the first pain is you tried to put too much junk in each function. That's usually what people have as their first pain point. That doesn't mean you need a different set of libraries. That means you need to make your, your functions more single purpose and you know, go, go read some of the Unix philosophy design books about what, what, a, what a function or, or a utility should be and make that as small as possible. And then so your workflow is passing from one function to the next instead of one function to rule them all. That's the first mistake that I've seen made most often. And then break into two libraries only when the thing is getting ungainly big. You know, maybe it's every time we build the project, the tests take a day to run because we're doing so much in here and the tests just run too long. Uh, maybe at that point we go, okay, what we really need to do is break this into two just so we can build the, the project, make changes and build it in a reasonable amount of time. And if there's like some kind of clear delineation we can break on. So I wouldn't break it up until you have some pain that you need to. Sorry, good stuff. Sorry, just come back in there. I'll just move on to Anna Kozak's question. Uh, so Anna asks, what is the best form for handling reproducibility of internal R codes, code bases and libraries? I think this might chime with the use this thing maybe. Or maybe yeah, not. Yeah, so good question, Anna. I'm not sure I've got a, um, I'm sure I don't have a complete answer. I got a couple of things that I found useful. Um, my couple of things I've found useful. One is uh, unit tests, right? So that, that's, I gave that example from the use this of the package test that, a little confusing. Um, th that package designed for writing unit tests around your code just helps us ensure that as we change our code, we aren't getting a different answer. And, you know, I make optimizations all the time just to fix runtime or, oh, this should be done in three different steps. And I know because those tests run and that, that I'm getting the same answer. And that's a big chunk of re reproducibility, right, is having some, some tests around those. Now, also, though, what I, what I try to encourage is if we've got uh, new people joining our teams, I alluded earlier to I try to figure out the 20% of the developer tools that give us 80% of the value. Um, I certainly would not in a data science team, unless you're really writing uh, huge amounts of production software and that's a real focus. Um, we, in our team talk about, we, had, we do producto types quite regularly. I haven't been full through a full design process like our internal IT projects, but we may be using them for something. Uh, something meaningful within the business. 
And so they aren't all gonna have full tests over the full surface. We are moving too fast um, and making changes too rapidly to necessarily always be able to do that on the whole project. However, the bit that goes into the library, I try to have tests around that. Now we may not on the other analysis have tests around all of it. But the other thing we do too is the process we call second set of eyes. And it's not a full on code review the way developers would do it. It's much more this 20, uh, 2080 rule or using 20% of the work to get 80% of the value. But it's somebody else has walked through this with me, understands my intent and has given it sort of a smell test and looked at it to see if it makes sense. Uh, that helps. Uh, with reproducibility. And then all along kind of underpinning this is hopefully developing a, a culture within the organization that um, really is discouraging some of the um, real slapdash uh, methods that we may find that, that really smart people come in because they learn to code maybe in a lab and they do stuff like, uh, you know, they, they, they do a, a delete all objects at the beginning of their script or something, right? Like that's terrible practice and makes you not play well with others. Make sure, you know, we're hopefully building a culture where they aren't gonna do that and we're getting them away from, you know, I, I remember years ago, people used to do things like work in R all day long and they're not writing out objects to files, they're actually saving their R environment. That was a thing people would do 10 years ago. Um, Hopefully we're helping, you know, folks that come in not do those sort of things, right? And tools like our markdown really help that because every time you build a markdown document, it, it effectively instantiates a completely new environment, a new session of R. So we can't be carrying around all this trash in our environment that we've just been saving to disk. So we're helping folks use modern workflow patterns with like our studio saving in projects and uh, doing some crisp and clean uh, methods that keep them from getting too junky. We're testing heavy on stuff that we call our libraries and we're doing second set of eyes on the things that are in between. That's generally the pattern I see and mix and match. What works for me isn't what's gonna work right in your organization. Great stuff. Uh, so I'll just actually uh, try to keep up here with questions. I'll go to John uh, Blissjack's one. Sorry, I don't know if I can pronounce that correctly. Uh, how do you distribute your internal R packages, mini CRAN, DRAT, install underscore GitHub, or some other strategies? Yeah, actually, I use a slightly different strategy. Um, we have an internal, um, I'm drawing a blank, internal package, artifactory, sorry, internal package, internal uh, package management system called Artifactory. The reason I use that with our packages is our development team was already using that for, um, for a whole bunch of other things, including uh, Linux packages, PIP packages for Python, and it supported CRAN. And so I looked at that and said, well, we've already got something, right? Let me use that. And so they set it up where I have permission to uh, write to that. And then we set up all of our clients to use our Artifactory install as the default CRAN library. And so everything sort of goes through there and it all kind of works. Uh, once again, that's, that's because we were solving a whole bunch of other problems. We already had this one in, it, there. I'm, I'm not saying you should, it, that's what everyone should use. It's a good solution. Uh, another good solution that's also, also heavy is um, is the RStudio package management. And by the way, but when I say it's heavy, it's not like a single user desktop application um, or storing your packages with your uh, projects. Um, those would be lighter solutions and work better for smaller teams. So if you've got a big team, you got an enterprise, you're probably gonna look at something like Artifactory or RStudio package manager. Um, once you get into the storing libraries with the actual project, I got to punt because I'm not an expert there. I haven't done enough of that to know because I've had these other solutions in place. So uh, go ask on the, uh, maybe the, the RStudio community site, community.rstudio.com. I bet you'll get a lot of opinions. So, you know, I'm not going to use the official package manager. I'm looking for 
one here, what's the trade-off between pack rat and there's a couple of others that are common. That's literally what I would do if I needed a, um, a one for a small team and didn't have these other options. Good stuff. Thanks for that. Um, I'll just actually go back to one of the Marchant's one. He's actually uh, up in the queue there. So he's up at the top. So I'll just uh, make sure I get there. What is the biggest benefit of book down over package down, PKG down, if that's how you say it? Yeah. So, so package down is really focused around the documentation of individual packages. And if everything you got is rolled up into a package, I think package down it, it is the, the, the tool you should be using, right? But it it's really designed around the, the package structure. When I use book down is if I'm documenting something like, like a whole workflow, the, the little, when I showed you guys a screenshot of one I'm working on, like the first step is getting our Jupyter uh, lab environment up and running because we have a custom kernel we use. And introduction to that environment, how to get it running, then how to use Git, uh, how we use Git. It isn't how to use it for everybody, it's how we use it. And that's an important distinction. And then we have a little bit about how to use how to use your R environment up and going. And uh, and I forget, we're gonna add some more chapters about how to do some specific things. Um, I think I've got Python sections and then I got another section. That documentation is no way, shape, or form le le linked to a um, to a package, and so I do that in book down, and then anything that was documentation of a package uh, is is more a package down solution. So I think that's the that's the delineator. Okay, yeah. Uh, so another one there uh, from Anna. Uh, any recommendations for the usage of GitHub Actions for a regular R user? So. Yeah, so GitHub Actions, what those are is they're things that GitHub fires off um, after you do every check-in. So you might imagine you have some, some tests or something that you want to um, want to run every time that you check something into, into GitHub. Uh, it's a good question. It's a relatively new uh, stack of tooling inside, inside GitHub. I, I'm using it. So these are under the general class is continuous integration tools is what the general class of these type things are called. Uh, the GitHub Actions didn't exist, uh, I believe, in its current form when I, when I did our cookbook and put it up online. So I used uh, GitHub hooks, which are a way of hooking, of having GitHub call other services. I used GitHub hook to call um, Travis CI. So the way that the website rc2e.com works, is anytime I push a change to the GitHub repo, after that commit is made, it calls uh, Travis CI and Travis builds the, uh, the HTML that's hosted and then saves that back into, uh, into GitHub. So that's an example of, uh, of, of using a triggered continuous integration event, right? A lot, you could imagine an organization using that to run a set of tests that uh, test suite that gets run against everything. Or every time you check in your package code, uh, you could fire off a build process that would build the, build the package for um, you know, multiple different uh, install bases or something, right? These are the sort of things we use it for. Um, th this, is, this is once again, getting around the edge of things that I don't have deep experience with. Like so many people, I figured out one thing that worked for me for my problem and then I stopped learning because I had something that worked. So I'm not super skilled in letting you know what all the different uh, ways of specifically using the GitHub uh, actions are. But I do encourage you to think about continuous integration for builds, uh, for um, building packages. Um, and because I, I think it's one of the most one of those interesting technologies from computer science that we can use over in data science to maybe do kind of different things than what they use it for. Great stuff. Um, we still have a few more coming, actually. There's a great sort of set of questions here tonight. Uh, Sayajan, how to use Docker or Plumber for API of R code? Uh, so for others and organizations to use R code? Yeah, so um, two kind of different sets of problems they're solving there. So if is, is the question, Kevin, about how to use Docker and Plumber, or is it how to use Docker or Plumber? Uh, Docker and Plumber. So I, I, I don't really have a, uh, more of a context from the question, but it's sort of a quick discussion yeah. of both will do. 
Now, let, let me explain what's interesting about both of those and probably not answer the question, but let me tell you what I think is interesting about both of those. Plumber, straight out of the gate, is an interesting stack of tools. So Plumber allows uh, you as an R writer to write code that then functions as an API endpoint. Uh, I have found this design model super useful uh, because I could write code and expose it to an, as an API and other people can consume it without using R. This is super useful in a, in a multilingual shop. One of the things you can do is you can even hook Excel to read from this API endpoint. And so my Excel users can refresh data, pass the U a different parameter in the URL and get fed back to them data that has run through some R process. That's a pretty powerful uh, tool. And that's really neat. And then we can take the same endpoint and Python developers can uh, you know, pass a parameter, say, you know, DLXYZ, give me, give me some model results or something. And my R code could run off and go do something. Uh, I don't actually have that type of endpoint, but it could do anything and then return back uh, you know, data or anything. It could even generate a PDF using our markdown and return that back to the user, right? Really useful for, uh, for regular reporting processes or even customized reporting processes. And it could be consumed uh, by an end user or it could be consumed by some tool that builds you know, board of directors books or management books. Super useful. Uh, that's that's um, Plumber. The Docker stack uh, is, is hairball I'm probably not gonna get into. <laughs> The, the neat thing about Docker is that it's a it's it's conceptually, though not literally, a virtualized machine. So everything is self-contained inside of, uh, of of a file of a script, and it allows you to create not just the thing that was useful for me with Docker is when I got my head around. Uh, I understood what reproducible example for code is, right? You go on Stack Overflow or on the R, R Studio community, and they're going to say, can you give me a reprex of what you're trying to do? It's a little chunk of reproducible code that could reproduce an, the exact problem you're having. So it's all boiled down. One of the neatest things about Docker is it allows you to produce a reproducible system state. So a whole machine defined by a configuration file and one of the neatest uses of it is reproducibly building an environment uh, in multiple places and you know exactly what's on it and what the state of that machine is. And one of the neat side effects is when something doesn't work, you can share it with someone who's trying to help you and give them the exact machine state because your Docker build file can allow them in their own machine to create that machine with that state and then run your example with it. And it's incredibly useful for testing. It eliminates this whole problem with runs on my machine, but doesn't run on somebody else's. Now the technology behind uh, Docker, uh, you know, we use in our Jupyter Lab server environment, because every time a user logs into uh, Jupyter Lab in our environment, we use a thing called Docker Spawner that spawns a virtual machine. And so that user is using that environment that's been spawned by Jupyter Lab incredibly useful and it means that um, you know I'm operating in a world that doesn't have everybody else right there in it. It's very contained. I can't damage anybody else's environment. Super useful. It's a whole bag of worms though. Docker is so much more than that. Uh, so I'll let you guys leave that to you to as an exercise to the listener to investigate more. Good stuff. Uh, Alicia asks, is it more comfortable to write project code in R scripts or in R markdown files? You know, I think this varies by individual is my best guess. Um, and it also kind of, I think it depends on what you're going to end up using it for. So for example, if the thing you're writing isn't uh, producing end user output, it's, um, it's producing maybe an ETL process. I find that a little more intuitive to write it in our script. And I kind of thought that was a pretty good heuristic. And then um, Emily Ritter wrote a really interesting blog post recently about how she uses our markdown as ETL scripts. And the 
resulting markdown document is effectively the log of the script. So it explains what's happening. It shows example output, tells how many records it wrote where. And I was like, oh crap, that's actually a really compelling use case for something that I would have completely said, my heuristic is don't use markdown for that. Use just an R script. And she makes a compelling case that actually you're getting like run human readable logging kind of for free by having this ETL process always fire off this, this R markdown document. And then, uh, you know, I think with that, you would need to like index the uh, resulting, uh, you know, PDF or HTML, make sure it gets a, a number appended after the file name. So you aren't overriding the previous results, but you basically then end up with a whole bunch of documents that explain your ETL process, what ran, what didn't, how many records were written. Uh, that's kind of interesting. And in a process that where the, the logs don't need to be or there's maybe not a place for them to be fed into a central log management system like many enterprises uses. Use if it's you know something much smaller and lightweight. That's a pretty interesting solution. So I tend to use the heuristic of if what I'm generating at the end of this thing is going to be a human readable document, then I use R Markdown kind of from the start. If what I'm using is uh, is not generating a bunch of human readable. Uh, output. Maybe it's writing into Excel or it's writing into somewhere else. I tend to do those in, uh, in R scripts. And then Emily Ritter has me re-examining my heuristics and thinking that may be overly restrictive. Good stuff. So we'll have to look out for that blog post, actually. So we'll have to sort of see if we can get it on uh, Twitter or something like that and repost it. Uh, just yeah. a, a quick one, actually, from Barry Cleary, actually. Uh, what are some go-to packages you use that aren't widely known? And that's actually something I'm very interested Ooh. in myself. Yeah, actually, um, the, one of my go-tos that isn't, and, I, and I'm going to, you'll see me looking at the other monitor here as I uh, glance up at a project I've been working on just to read um, one of the ones that's a sleeper is GG Repel, G -G -R -E -P -E -L. What GG Repel does is allows you to put annotations in a GG plot and the actual annotations won't stack on top of each other. They repel each other away. And it has a whole bunch of neat features like um, you can actually line a whole bunch of annotations up in a row and their arrows will point to the point that you're that they're annotating. So it's basically all about annotating without the labels stacking on top of each other. Because kind of by default, uh, ggplot will will do annotations, but they'll often stack up, and you don't get a lot of fine grain control on where those are placed. So one of the things I do is use ggrepel with a subset operation to only label a handful of interesting points for some definition of interesting, right? Uh, so not labeling everything, only labeling a few things, but use GG repel so they end up maybe in a line, maybe stacked vertically, just not overlapping. Uh, that's, that's a sleeper for sure. Um, you know, a, a whole bunch of the other stuff I used is kind of part of the tidyverse, which is the opposite of not being well known, right? Those are sort of very well known. Um, the, the one I often confuse the name with plumber is janitor. The janitor package, uh, which I frequently call by the wrong name, what janitor does is it uh, cleans up uh, data frame names. And you can sort of tell it what the heuristic you want to use for cleaning up. But you know, especially when I'm getting data in from folks who have Excel files, they just love to put human readable names and stuff. They got spaces and doing crazy stuff with capitalization and all that. And I can run it through janitor and it'll replace the spaces with underscores. And I think that's configurable. Configurable, you can make it replace them with dashes if you want. Uh, but it does this scrubbing of names and, uh, and it does them in a consistent way. So they keep sending me the data with their weird headings. All I do is run it through janitor, usually with the defaults. And I get names that are, uh, you know, as long as they didn't do something like completely change the name, change the letters, I make everything lowercase and replace all spaces. And uh, then I don't have to put like the names in quotes when they run through my code. So it's just a quick way of cleaning up uh, the, the, the human readable, but not coding friendly stuff. So I think those are my two, those are my two sleeper packages.
Absolutely. I actually love Janitor as well. A fantastic package. So so useful. Uh, we're going to try well, I got one or two questions left for myself and then we'll wrap it up because I know yeah. we're going to be going on a while, but this is a great Q&A. Uh, Ginny, tell us, how are you getting on over in Richmond with the lockdown? How is that working out for you specifically? Well, for, for me, we had, uh, we had just moved back. My wife is originally from Richmond, Virginia area. We had just moved back here uh, last October and bought a house. And I was so, I'm so thankful that we, I was going to be working from home two days a week anyway. So I had a nice home office with good space and, you know, door to shut to keep the kid out and all that. And, you know, good bandwidth. And I was in a fantastic position. So in a bunch of ways, I'm loving working from home. Um, What's most interesting, and I think the thing that surprises me is right before this call, I was talking to one of my colleagues in Dublin, and two things I've noticed. One is, in some ways, the world feels smaller sometimes because we're all kind of in this weird-ass thing together. And that's sometimes it feels really big and sometimes it feels really small all at the same time. The other thing we've discovered is that at, from a work point of view, we're going to do stuff differently even after there's a vaccine. So let me give you an example of a workflow we're going to completely change. We used to do this thing where we'd have someone in Bermuda, someone in the U.S., usually me, and then we'd have four developers or five developers, IT folks in Dublin, and we'd all get on a call. Well, the five developers would go into a conference room, and they'd be in a conference room, and like me and the guy in Bermuda would be on the video conferencing gear in the corner of the room, you know, looking down. We're never doing that again. We ain't going back. What we're going to do is when we have a we have a geographically distributed meeting, everybody's taking it like we're taking this call right now. Everybody's going to be at their desk with their headphones on, having the same experience. Because what's so critical is you then you're there is no remote and local. It's just people having a meeting. And before, when we have five people in a room, they're having a different experience, right? They're seeing gestures. They're, you know having a faster conversation because there's no video audio lag and everybody else is just might as well not be there or is only basically voyeuring on a meeting they're having. Once we all get in video conference together, everybody's having the same meeting. So that's something we're not going back. You know, if there's remote people, I'm going to make at least any teams that I work on. The rule is if anyone's not there together, everybody takes it from their desk. If it's too disruptive, take it from your desk, go home and take the call because the experience is completely different. That's sure true that the world is much smaller place. We That's something we found here with the YR seminar series is that we have people regularly from Africa, South America, North America, and of course, Europe, and sometimes even Asia, depending on the time zone issues. So it's a certainly, certainly the world has changed a lot and we're delighted about how that has worked out. Um, so just actually something I'm also interested in. You started out as an economist and you specialized in agriculture. I'm very interested in your journey as a data scientist. You don't have to sort of give a full biography there, but it's just sort of very interesting how people, how different people's journeys are. Yeah, I'll tell you a little story and then I'll kind of illustrate it, right? That's the, that's the best way to answer a question, I think. Um, I remember in... 1996, I think I was fit, I was just starting my master's work at the University of Kentucky. And so I was just getting oriented with uh, just finishing up undergrad. And I was talking to, I guess, this professor who would later become my, my master's uh, advisor, uh, Dr. J. Skies at University of Kentucky. And there had been a, a career recruitment day uh, for recruiting graduate students, right, for, for jobs. And so I went just Who's there, right? And, you know, of course, there's Archer's Daniels Midland, uh, you know, Cargill, uh, you know, I think maybe John Deere had somebody, a bunch of ag stuff, right? You would expect that. And then there was American Express, the credit card company. And I went back to him and I was like, what's up with American Express? And he said, oh, that's funny. One of my PhD students just took a job with American Express. And he said, the thing American Express likes about agricultural economists with advanced degrees is they've dealt with real data. They know a programming language enough to do statistical analysis with it. And they're used to solving real applied problems. And I'm like, looking back at that now, I'm like, oh, we were data scientists, weren't we? 
And that sort of cracks me up every time I think back on it, because we didn't have a term for what this was for you know, a significant amount of time. But it's this idea of understanding. Now, in that case, the specific what, what American Express was saying is, you know, if we think about domain specific knowledge, statistics, and then computing tools, American Express was basically saying, we can teach you the domain. We like that you have computing skills and statistical knowledge. And what happened, my exact course was, a, was, a, was different than that, but I ended up going and, and knowing how to do stochastic modeling and doing stochastic modeling at insurance companies and then with KPMG for a while. And then because I had had a background of looking at, at crop insurance risk, I got recruited by a crop insurance company that at the time was, was owned by Renaissance Re. And Ren Re has a history of not caring exactly what anybody's field is. They just hire smart people and kind of define problems for them and turn them loose. And they discovered that I kind of worked in that mold. So after the insurance company was sold off, um, I was recruited to stay with the company and uh, move to Bermuda and be part of the, the corporate risk management team, having, having nothing particular to do with agriculture, other than that's one of the small line of risk. And I still work with that line of, line of business 20% of my time, but the other 80% of my time is, uh, is with corporate risk management because I understood stochastic modeling and all these very conceptual things to do with risk management. So that's how I ended up here. Good stuff. I think we'll finish with this one, actually. Just a sort of yeah. uh, advice to career young data scientists or people who's probably still in PhD programs or just starting PhD programs. Like, what sort of advice would you give them? How do you think the field is going to change over the next five to ten years? What, you know, what pointers would you give there? Yeah, so, so the biggest, mis I'm going to speak in the negative and then I'm going to put it in the positive. The, the speak just briefly in the negative. The biggest mistake I see being made, I think is a mistake, is chasing hot technologies, chasing the, the newest hotness. And the problem with that is you're wrong by whatever you, if you're, you know, 25, 30 year old, new career coming right out of graduate school, uh, you miss, it's very easy to conflate press coverage, uh, excited things people talk about, confuse that with what's actually useful and what's actually being used in practice and solves real problems. And so you get all excited and you learn a very narrow defined set of tooling and then you discover nobody's really actually using that, or it's not that valuable. It's just really interesting. And the better heuristic is to get useful and learn whatever tooling allows you to solve different problems and be useful at them. The being useful is a way more value than any specific skill stack. Now, if you can be the top one half of 1% with a certain skill stack, stack that's a different story. Like if you're the best Spark memory manager, um, you know, in North America or one of the top 10 in the world or something. Oh, yeah, yeah. That's that's great. You, go do that. Right. Knock yourself out. That's not where most of us are living. Most of us are trying to say, OK, I want to sell um, my data science ability to some organization that then is going to pay me to do that kind of stuff. They need to know you're useful. And so you need to build a set of experience of being useful. Um, and being useful usually means you can extract data, you can manipulate data, you can produce output. Like those three things are the crux of the analyst work. Now, there's no data science in that particularly as, as we are currently calling it. But if you greatly understand you know, some esoteric algorithm or a handful of, of, of algorithms. Uh, you know, if you're a deep learning guru, but you can't manipulate data, extract data, manipulate data to feed your models and then do something with output. Uh, it's like, you're not that useful right out of the gate because I got to, in my organization, pair you with somebody that's going to make up for your deficiencies. So make sure you work like all the basic skills and then maybe add a specialty on top of it. Now your specialty may be a technical stack, a set of modeling, or it may be like mine, which is uh, an industry specialty. Like I know a lot about reinsurance and I know a lot about crop insurance. Uh, I have 
deep domain knowledge in those two. And then I've got a really useful set of tools uh, that I can bring to bear on those problems that I, that I have a deep understanding of. So you gotta kind of figure out which one you're gonna be. Are you gonna be the top one half of 1% and compete on that? Or are you gonna be just tremendously useful and be able to get a job in a lot of different places because you've got a useful stack? And most of us are probably gonna benefit more from being the latter. Good stuff. Thanks very much. Folks, I think we leave it there and we'll just sort of finish up. This is that. Uh, thanks, JD, for his uh, uh, talk and, and also the Q&A, which I, I really enjoyed. Uh, and uh, folks, uh, we'll just actually like to sort of say we're going to take a break for two weeks at least. And so what's going to happen over the next few weeks is USAR, originally due to take place in St. Louis, uh, St. Louis and uh, Munich, will be going virtual. So they're going to have a series of events over the next two weeks. So look out for that on the internet, on Twitter and uh, so on. I'll go to the website. And so uh, that's what we will be. We'll be taking a break for two weeks. And I think we're coming back at the end of July. Uh, so we'll leave it there, folks. Thanks very much. Thanks again, Judy. And we'll call it a day. Martin. Thank you.